Thank you all very much for joining us this morning. My name is Steve McMenamin. I'd like to welcome you to the ongoing series of the Greenwich Roundtable. Uh, our topic this morning, the role of the Chief Investment Officer, is a continuation of our discussion on the, some of the cultural phenomenon that actually aid in the wealth creation process. Uh, our moderator this morning is John Griswold. John is the Executive Director of the Common Fund Institute. He's the Vice Chairman of the Greenwich Roundtable. And um, uh, without any further ado, I'll turn it over to John. Please welcome John as he sets the table up for today's discussion. Thanks, Steve. Great to see a good turnout in such a uh, sultry time of year. Uh, and I hope those of you who came from New York it didn't have too much difficulty getting out here. But uh, we're delighted to have this panel with us this morning. Uh, when Steve suggested I moderate this, I said, wow, that's, that's a little off the beaten track. But it actually, the more I thought about it, the more I thought it was very appropriate. There's increasing discussion, particularly in the broader institutional investment market, about the role of governance and the role of those who actually are assigned to manage funds as fiduciaries. And of course, there's always a long argument that occurs in uh, committees, uh, which is their want. Uh, but in fact, the uh, discussion very often revolves around, should we hire a CIO? Should we hire a staff, internal staff? Should we outsource that function somehow? Or should we just continue what we're doing, which is to meet 12, 15, 20 hours a year as volunteers as a committee and try to manage it ourselves with outside sub-advisors? There's a great deal of discussion that does go on along these lines. And this morning, we've got three experts who have been in this field for a very long time doing or observing and studying this phenomenon, this, this function. My immediate left, Alice Handy, started Investor, a company for the management of assets in December of 2003. Investor serves as the investment office to nonprofits where building an investment staff in-house is not economical nor preferable. Prior to Investor, Alice worked for the University of Virginia from 1974 to 2003. She was the first investment officer, and later became treasurer and finally president of the University of Virginia Investment Management Company. Alice began her career as a bond portfolio manager and assistant vice president at Travelers Insurance Company. She also served as state treasurer for the Commonwealth of Virginia from October of 1988 to January of 1990. Alice currently serves on the Investment Advisory Committee for the Virginia Retirement System, the Rockefeller Foundation, the board of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation, Shenandoah Life Insurance Company, and the Bessemer Securities Corporation. To Alice's left is Andre Perold. Andre Perold is the George Gunn Professor of Finance and Banking at the Harvard Business School. Professor Perold's research is focused on asset allocation policies of endowments and pension funds, the structure and evolution of the investment management industry, and risk management and implementation, implementation efficiency within investment organizations. He has authored numerous articles and case studies, and he is co-author of the books The Global Financial System, A Functional Perspective and Cases in Financial Engineering, Studies of Applied Financial Innovation. His teaching is focused primarily in investment management and capital markets, and he has received many awards for teaching excellence. Might also mention he was co-founder of the Harvard Endowment Institute, which we ran at Harvard for many years for Common Fund. It did an amazing job. Andre is founding partner and chair of the investment committee of High Vista Strategies, a firm that specializes in the management of broadly diversified portfolios of marketable and alternative asset classes. He also serves as director of the Vanguard Group, as board chairman of UNX, or UNX, is it pronounced? UNX. UNX. As an editor and as an editorial board member of the Financial Analyst Journal. Welcome, Andre. To Andre's left is Larry Cultured. Larry was appointed chief investment officer at Georgetown University in June of 2004. In addition to serving as CIO, he teaches investment courses for the McDonough School of Business at Georgetown. Previously, Larry was Managing Director of Equity and Hedge Fund Investments for the Virginia Retirement System and Adjunct Professor of Finance for the McIntyre School of Commerce at the University of Virginia. Prior to joining VRS, he was full-time faculty member at UVA. 
Before his return to academia, Larry accumulated over 10 years of experience in corporate finance and capital markets. He currently serves on the Investment Committee of St. Louis University and the College of William and Mary. Larry holds a BA in Economics from the College of William and Mary, an MBA in Finance and Accounting from the University of Rochester, an MA and PhD, and PhD in Economics from the University of Virginia, and is a CFA charter holder. We welcome our panelists, and I'm going to start with a question for, uh, for Alice. Alice, uh, as I mentioned, the, the role of the and function of the CIO seems to have been developing over a good period of time. Can you start, give us a little history of the evolution of the role? Sure. Um, I do have the longest tenure in that role here um, on the panel, and so I think that's why they selected me for this job. I used to have a cartoon uh, that was in my office, and it had a woman sitting at a computer in her kitchen. And it said, I do a little bit of cooking, I do a little bit of cleaning, and I run a $1 billion fund. Um, and, and that was, it, it, we obviously didn't do cooking and cleaning, and we weren't in our kitchen um, running it, but the early CIOs did just a little bit of everything, and it really described the early part of my career. Uh, the role of the CIO today is very different, but let me go back a little bit in history. So when I first began at the University of Virginia, I was the first investment officer that they'd ever had. Before that, they had just been part of the controller of the university, reported directly to the board. Um, and there still were only a minimal number of dedicated CIOs, uh, mostly at the very large endowments. Uh, 1974 was the year that the Harvard Management Company was formed. Um, Yale had a dedicated office, and the University of California actually had did direct investments in stocks and had a rather elaborate large staff. But, but most uh, of the schools had individuals who also doubled as the college or university treasurer and had numerous other responsibilities. Um, the endowment just didn't seem like a full-time job at that time. Mine included procuring all of the university's insurance, titling vehicles, issuing travel advances, etc. And for those uh, that, well, that didn't have a dedicated office, um, it was much the same as the small schools are doing now. The Finance or Investment Committee made all of the decisions. And going back even a step further, back to the 1960s, was even more interesting. And it was very typical that you would have a trust company that would tee up a couple of stocks that then on a quarterly basis would go to an investment committee and they'd make a decision whether to hold or sell things that were in their particular portfolio. And the idea of an independent investment advisor was still fairly new in the 1970s. There were not a lot, but a lot were starting up as you got towards the end of that period. Um, over time, I assumed a lot more treasury responsibilities, so stopped doing travel advances and payroll advances and started doing things like issuing debt and management of the direct real estate investments of the university. But bit by bit, by 1990, I began to shed most of these additional tasks, and by 2000, I was solely devoted to managing the endowment. But I did some varied things in addition to issuing all the debt. I also ran an inn and combined it with a golf course and was responsible for that. Um, so there were lots of other things that were going on at universities. I loved that part of it. You know, it was very, very interesting and stimulating, but it was clear um, by the end of the 1990s that the endowment needed some full-time management. The interface with the investment committee also changed a lot over that time. Um, in the beginning, the committee made all the decisions, and the reporting and monitoring was really the job of the chief investment officer. Um, but with the rise of the consultants in the 1970s who were feeding ideas to the investment officers, um, we now were responsible for identifying new investment opportunities and recommending managers, but it was still the old idea of tee up three and the committee chooses one. Um, it was a very interesting time, and, and it was never really very predictable which one because a lot of it um, was a beauty pageant. Whoever presented best on that particular day uh, usually got the job. Fast forward to today, at most of the large endowments, and those over a billion or so, um, there is a dedicated CIO, there is a staff that can range from one to two assistants to a full-fledged office of 20 or more uh, professionals on the staff. Um, but equally important to the growth of the role of the CIO is, is why did it happen? Uh, what was the cause? 
Well, I think first was the size of the endowments. Um, back when I started in the 1970s, the University of Virginia's endowment was $50 million. So if you think of 5%, 4 or 5 percent, on $50 million, it didn't represent very much of the budget. It really was for special projects or for a particular professorship. But we used to call it just the margin of excellence as opposed to really a meaningful number. But today that endowment is over $3 billion, and the, while the budget has grown, 4 to 5% of $3 billion is a lot of money. Um, and most importantly, it grabs the attention of both the board and the president. So they become uniquely and um, very passionately involved and interested in how that endowment is working, in addition to it being, um, you know, for comparative purposes, a bragging point with either their colleagues or, or their buddies if they're on a board. Um, for my clients, um, and for most well-endowed private schools, this endowment now represents some 30 or more percent of their budget, and so it's a very, very integral part um, to the success of a particular school. Um, and it's also important um, to, in terms of their competitive advantage with their peers, because if a peer institution with whom they're competing has a much bigger endowment, then they have more resources to attract faculty, et cetera. And so it's a huge issue for them. Um, the second reason why the CIO's role grow, grew was the uh, increase in the number of investment options. So up until the late 1990s, if you had a modest portfolio um, and you invested in just stocks and bonds, um, and if you threw in and made that major leap into international at some point in the uh, late 80s or early 90s, um, you could have done quite well as long as you had a heavy equity bias and um, some decent managers, some above ma average manager, or even more important than above average manager was you stayed with those managers, that you weren't continually flipping in and out of them at all the wrong times. But in the end of the 1990s, the extraordinary returns in venture capital and then the rise of the hedge funds with the declining markets in 2000 and 2002, 2001 and 2002, it became apparent to many schools that the old committee-centric model might not be ideal going forward. Um, diversification into alternatives was certainly publicized by David Swenson and Yale, but it had been used extensively by large endowments for a very long time. And it was outperforming the old buy and hold strategies by very wide margins. And so there became a big disparity between the returns in the large endowments and the small endowments. So this new model for the investment committee um, made investing, uh, required a very different level of due diligence. Uh, performance was based more on manager talent than just on market direction. So you couldn't just get it right to have a lot of equities in the portfolio you also had to think hard about who it was that you were investing with. So as a result, um, some of the smaller schools um, started hiring CIOs, um, people that had had, schools that had had a hundred million dollar endowment now faced themselves, uh, now faced having 500 to 600 million dollars. So started thinking it was time to think about a CIO. Uh, my business of outsourcing the investment office has grown in many different forms um, out there. And smaller schools scrambled to participate through the use of fund of funds or hiring a new consultant, making changes in their funds and the way they were doing things. And as, as with all evolutions, um, just as the time of the stature of the CIO was rising, um, there were also new ways of delivering this service uh, were coming forth. So the role of the chief investment officer, as I indicated before, has grown over time from <coughs> primarily serving as an executor, uh, executor, excuse me, executor is probably right, of the dictates of the investment committee, to today's CIO has full delegation over the authority to select manager and interfaces with the committee in probably the appropriate role, um, which are the big issues of asset allocation, guidelines, spending policy, and major strategic decisions. Um, this is good for the CIO because the increase in responsibility obviously encourages talented individuals to enter this field. But on the negative side, the flip side, is the CIO position has become commoditized. It was not uncommon when I first entered this business for the CIO to stay uh, for a lifetime at an institution. And in fact, I always thought that that was what I would do. 
But now when you speak to an investment committee, they are perfectly happy to have a CIO have a maximum of five years at a school. Um, and if there's also turnover on a committee, so at UVA, a board member had a tenure of four years, so you have a CIO there for five years, a board member there for ten years, there's no one left with a corporate memory um, necessary to capitalize on lessons learned in the past and also the very, very long time horizon that an endowment has. Um, so becoming a CIO is now a business decision. The compensation is, is appropriate. Um, but it's not the passion that it used to be. And in some ways, I, I bemoan that. Um, but enough of history. Um, what is the role of the CIO? I, th I think of it as I having three primary roles when I'm out there. I'm an allocator of assets, and my responsibility is to be able to communicate um, my philosophy and where the portfolio is going to a boarding committee. And I also run a business. And because I have a private company, I'm also the rainmaker. I have to get out and get the clients and bring them in. Um, the role of the allocator of assets that is the portfolio manager. And when we go out and look at managers, we think that this is one of the most difficult things for a new startup to do. Uh, we know that a lot of people that start investment management businesses are very good at picking stocks or analyzing positions or knowing what's going on. But the role of portfolio manager is very different because you're trying to size your positions, think about risk. How does it all come together? Um, having weathered many storms over the past three decades, they've developed some sensitivity, I hope anyway, to mistakes that should be avoided and things that have worked in the past. So I view my responsibility as trying to understand the investment environment. Um, not call tops and bottoms, which a lot of people think that's what we do. But we have to be aware of warning signs and size the risk of the portfolio appropriately, because that's our job. We can't get caught up in believing that we're in a new paradigm, that things are going to be different this time. We always have to try to be rational, although in the investment environment, as you know, it's very, very difficult to do that. Um, but I have a very talented staff, and I view my job as to let them go, give them as much lease as we can, but just keep giving them that overall guidance, that history of how things have happened over time. Um, as a practical matter, though, we have a very open environment, and I think, you know, in all the investment offices I know, they do. And by the time a recommendation comes forth, I've vetted it, I've talked to them about it, we've talked about sizing, we've talked about history. Um, and so very little is actually overridden at that point. Uh, philosophically, I like concentrated positions uh, with managers, a very limited number of managers. And I believe that there, as I believe that there's a finite number of the truly talented, gifted managers um, out there with really great ideas. Um, but we don't have to get them all right. Um, we talk a lot about there's no called strikes in this business. We just have to be sure that those that we've selected are excellent and above average, um, in average. But having said that, you know, in order to invest billions of dollars, which is what we're all challenged with now on the larger side, um, and if we want to invest it in alternatives or new ideas, there's very finite amounts of money that you can put into these areas. And so we always end up with more managers than we'd like to because the size of the allocations that we can get sometimes are smaller than what we'd like. Um, there are many qu excellent quantitative tools out there um, in managing, but I think that... Um, a chief investment officer has to have a very healthy gut, and a lot of the decisions that I make are made rationally, but not totally systematically. They're based on previous experience. Um, so why my primary job is to produce very, very good returns consistently it's all for naught if you can't explain it to your board or committee, if they don't understand your philosophy, if they can't stand with you. Because one thing we know are the markets are cyclical, they go up and down, and there's going to be bad periods that you're going to have to weather. Um, it's a very challenging job for the CIO, particularly if you have a philosophical difference with a committee. And if you stay in a place for a lifetime or a long time, you are going to have philosophical differences with some members of the committee over that period of time. And it's also problematic if you have frequent turnover and a loss of corporate memory. You know, why did you do something in the past? Can we stay with this? Um, because remember that we have a very long time horizon. 
Um, for most of my colleagues, this is really the most challenging and frustrating part of their job. And I think it's partially why you don't see a lot of people coming into the business exactly the way that I did it, because thinking of dealing with one board is enough, but thinking of dealing with multiple boards is pretty overwhelming thought. Um, but I think that, on the other hand, a properly constructed board is just a pure delight. Um, because they're a sounding board and they help you make great decisions and they're also, you know, the conscience of a school. I mean, they are the ones that are the keeper of the corporate memory and it's an extraordinarily important job that they have out there. So it's one of my favorite parts of the job, but reporting, when I have a no surprises kind of philosophy, is often critical to the success of this kind of a relationship. And it's also important that you have lots of touch points with your committee that aren't always the same, so that they don't become boring for you or the committee member. And then finally, and you know, certainly not last or least, the CIO has a business to run. We have employees to hire. We have to train and motivate them. We have a budget to develop. And we have rules and regulations that we have to comply with. And we often discount this part of our job and let it just go on. Um, but, but like any marriage that isn't nurtured, you, you, you have problems in the long run if you do this. Um, it's also a real challenge for a CIO to keep their office small enough um, so that the CIO is really making decisions. Because after all, the board was hired the chief investment officer to be the spokesperson, but also to be the the overarching philosophy and philosopher of the particular endowment. So that's really important. Um, I, I fell into this role uninformed and um, totally unprepared. I've been a bond trader, um, but had the love of investing and playing cars and the social skills, I guess, to pull it off or make it fun at any rate. Um, I've always told people that come into our office that we have this incredible privilege of getting to talk to some of the best investors every day. Um, and sharing those ideas. And I think, you know, for the first 20 years of my career, I had no um, idea of, you know, really what I had there when I was doing it until I started trying to recruit more in the office and the young people, and they're going like, I can talk to so-and-so on the phone today. Isn't that great? Um, and so, so we're continually challenged. We have very talented staffs. And we get to take our rewards and our lumps daily. I mean, we always know where we're performing. And so I just think it's one of the best jobs in the world. Thanks, Alice. Uh, that's a fascinating derivation of the history of this and the evolution of this role. Uh, Andre, you studied uh, board governance, risk management, sort of some of the elements of, in that area that the CIO today faces that you think have changed dramatically during your period of observation of this role. Uh, thanks, John, and uh, it's great to be here, and thank you, Alice. Uh, it is a fun job. Um, I've only been doing it as a job uh, for the last few years, uh, having written about it uh, before, and uh, it is a fascinating challenge to, to have to think about investing around the world uh, in the world we're in today, particularly. Um, you know, the functions of the CIO primarily are how do you get return? And how do you not take too much risk? You know, that's, that's your problem in a nutshell. Um, and when it comes to risk, how do you even measure risk? How do you know how much risk you're taking in the first place? And how do you define risk? And these aren't, these aren't easy things. But the fact is, you can't duck them. Uh, and to pretend they're not big issues uh, is a big mistake. Um, the world we're in is a sort of fascinating place, and I'm going to say these words that I know I'm not supposed to say, but this time it is different, I believe. Um, it is very different in a very important sense, and that is that um, just the scale and scope of investment opportunities today is extraordinary. If you look at the, the, at the global public equity capital markets in 1991, they were $9 trillion globally. Uh, market cap of public equities around the world. Today it's 55 going on $60 trillion. That's an extraordinary growth of, of investment opportunities. Think just of, of, of firms, of businesses out there, places to invest money. It, it is unbelievable, in fact, when you think about how rapid the growth has been. The U.S. has gone from something like $3 trillion to $20 trillion in that time. Uh, places like Great Britain have had similar, similar growth. 
Um, the big story, of course, is emerging markets that have gone from a trillion to 10 trillion today and growing very uh, rapidly. Um, and a lot of it is just business growth, uh, some of it's market appreciation, and a lot of it is IPOs of new firms and enterprises that didn't exist uh, over there privately, but now they are public and we can invest in them. And then add to that the vast uh, array of private investment opportunities, and add to that the hedge funds uh, and the private equity firms and the real estate firms and the commodity firms and all of those. And it's a very long, complex list. And add to that the the instruments you have to tailor risk, the credit default swaps, um, separating alpha and beta, um, all of the other derivatives. Global derivatives today are at $400 trillion. Uh, it, is, is a, it is extraordinary. Um, the risks today feel different. They're not bigger or smaller than risks in the past, but they're different. Uh, what's going to blow us up is different. Um, who bears risk is different. Um, you know, Amaranth uh, advisors lost $6 billion in about a week, and, and, and no one even blinked. I'm not sure anyone even knew it happened. Um, you know, Bear Stearns, uh, a billion and a half went to zero, and, and, and no one seems to really care. Um, how, how risk is distributed around the world is just very different. And your job as a CFO is to say, okay, how do I make sense of all this stuff? And how do I pick from this vast menu um, in, a, in a way to get return and yet manage risk. And, 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 and it's not an easy task, uh, as, as I'm sure everyone around here would uh, agree. Um, if you look at who's done well and who hasn't done so well, the median endowment uh, has, has not added any value to a passive 60-40 index. Um, the median uh, fund manager uh, doesn't beat the index. So most people uh, don't add any value. Um, a few do. Uh, if you look at Harvard and Yale and other large endowments, uh, they've done spectacularly. Uh, a dollar invested in Yale's endowment is worth around $10 today uh, or more. Um, and um, so everyone says, well, let's copy what Yale does. Um, and, and in fact, it's not hard to copy. Just read uh, the books written by David Swenson. He's written two books, and they're fabulous books. Um, the only problem is I'm not sure why he wrote the books, because if you read them, he says, here's what I've done, but by the way, it's really hard to do, and you can't do it, so don't try. Um, so, but nevertheless, people think uh, it's an easy game, and money is flooding into all these areas, as we know, on a scale we've never seen before. It is different this time. My students used to come to me and say, you know, when I graduate, I want a job at a hedge fund. Um, could you help me, hook me up with so-and-so, connect me to so-and-so, and, and, and I'd say, sure, I'll do my best and, and, and see if I can help. Nowadays, the students come to me and they say, well, I've just finished my first year. For the summer, uh, I'd like to start a hedge fund in India or something. Um, <laughs> can you help out? Um, so it is different this time. It, it is insane. Uh, uh, um, you know, when it, when it comes to risk management, even there, you know, how do you think sensibly about risk? If, if you look at the way endowments have been managed, they have policy portfolios, 60-40 or something like that, and you negotiate that policy portfolio with your board or your investment committee or whatever it is, and, and you set one that's appropriate for the institution. The problem with that idea is that risk changes over time. We, we, we go through periods when risk is very low or appears to be, and we go through periods when risk is very high. And a 60-40 doesn't distinguish between those periods. So if you buy 60-40, you're always getting changing risk. It's a random risk. And the question is, should you rather say, let me try and measure risk explicitly, and when it's high, I'll back off, and when it's low, I'll, take, I'll have higher exposures. Um, and in, in other words, should you have a, what's called a risk budget um, rather than a, a, a policy portfolio. The policy portfolio is a proxy for risk. There's no question that 60-40 stocks bonds is not as risky as 100% stocks. It's more risky in some sense than 100% bonds. Um, depends how you measure risk. But, but just on the risk side alone, we are so far from having a, an agreed upon and, a, and an institutionally accepted way of thinking about risk that, that that alone is hard. Then risks change over time. And if you're going to try to explicitly measure and estimate risk so you can manage it, um, you need to think about things like changing correlations. Um, 
the correlation between stocks and bonds was very high for decades at a time of high inflation and volatile inflation. Uh, so when interest rates went up, uh, bonds went down and stocks went down. Um, but in the last seven years, we've had the opposite. We've had interest rates uh, go up, mean bonds go down, but stocks go up. Uh, we've had a negative correlation between stocks and bonds uh, because we're in a world where inflation is under control, um, more or less. And when it's under control, uh, what drives interest rates is the global demand uh, for money. And, uh, and if, if, if interest rates rise, those are good times. And in good times, stocks go up. So, so the correlation is different. When the correlation is different, how you com think about combining stocks and bonds, it's a very different uh, combination. The diversification benefits of bonds are much higher today when the correlation is negative than when they were positive. In the 80s and 90s, whether you bought stocks or bonds, they both went up. Uh, correlation was very high. Uh, now it's a different story. Um, so bonds are a good diversifier today. They weren't before. Uh, but other things are not good diversifiers. Emerging markets, all the global markets, are the equity markets are extremely highly correlated. And um, there is, there's almost no diversification benefit from being abroad, so, or being here, or being anywhere. Uh, you can be in all these places, and they all move together. It's an extraordinary thing to see how connected the world's equity markets are. So, you know, you, you have to really ask yourself, where do you get diversification today? Um, you know, uh, foreign markets are more volatile than uh, the U.S. market, but almost perfectly correlated. So there's two ways to own uh, U.S. equities. You can own U.S. equities or you can own foreign equities with some cash to bring the volatility down, and those are about the same. Or you can, there's two ways to to own uh, foreign markets. You can buy foreign markets, or you can buy the U.S. equity market and lever it up. And those are about the same because the correlation is so high. And you just have to equate the volatilities. Um, so in, in this world, you know, risk is very different, it feels like, um, just from where we sit. And, and you know, we're, we're in this global economy that is doing extremely well. Um, how does it end is, is sort of the big question we all have to worry about. Um, and, and how do you position a portfolio to take, to sort of to maybe insulate yourself uh, to do that? And so the rage today is, of course, to, to buy these, you know, fat tail insurance. You know, so everybody says, well, I don't want to give up on my equity exposure. You know, this economy is fabulous and markets keep going up. So I want to, you know, I want all the upside, but I, I, I don't want the downside. So how do I find insurance to protect me? And it's very reminiscent of the days when we did portfolio insurance in the 80s when, um, you know, you could buy puts on the S&P or you could try and replicate a portfolio insurance strategy. So you had all the upside that limited your downside. And versions of that are out there again on a big scale as nobody wants to give away the upside. Because in part, people have come to define risk as I don't want to do any worse than the best player out there. It's, it's not enough to get an adequate return. Uh, it's that, well, Yale's up, so Harvard has to, has to keep up. I mean, I can't wait to see what's going to happen this year. You know, Yale's rumored to be having a fabulous year, uh, a number that could start with a three. And, um, and Harvard, I'm sure, is not going to have a three in front of it. And, and, and what is going to happen at Harvard? They're going to, they, they, you know, they, they could shoot the guy there. Um, <laughs> so it's, but I think it's true in, in, the, in, the, in the industry, and, and there's a horse race on the upside, at the same time that people are petrified of the downside. And so the whole risk-reward game is changing. Now, your function as a CFO is to somehow say, I'm not going to play that game. But how can you not play the game? We need part, that's what's going on, and that's the whole environment we're in. <coughs> um, but your job is not to. Your, your, your job, you're a steward of the organization, of, of the institution that you're trying to protect for the long term. And so how you deal with all of these issues, uh, the great scale and scope of things, uh, we're in a world where the horse race is a, is a very difficult one and a very dangerous one. Um, that's your problem today. Anyway, maybe I'll stop there and we can, we can take more. Andre, let me follow up with a question. Now, you, look, you, you mentioned Harvard. Uh, Yale's a little different, of course, but there are many good, in, the, in the evolution of this role, you're seeing more rapid turnover. There are many more searches for CIOs, more decisions to hire CIOs and staff, even though there aren't many staff. We see in our research about 17% of the broad nonprofit sector 
uh, hiring or having the title of CIO, many of those are unfilled, but the, and they're looking. Uh, and, and Alice mentioned that starting with about half a billion dollars, you're, you're seeing more and more searches, notwithstanding I'm not sure that a lot of them have done the cost-benefit analysis or the cost-efficiency analysis of hiring an internal staff versus some sort of outsourcing model. But is there a risk in the fact that we are seeing the hiring, I, mean, I, I don't know what you'd call it, maybe a systemic or governance risk here, that they're hiring more CIOs, that those people are likely to be ambitious and will move on more quickly than, as Alice says, the lifetime appointments that used to be more common. And in fact, you're, you're, you're introducing a systemic risk into the business in that way. I mean, I think absolutely. I, you know, I'd say two things on that. One is that we all have to understand that the only thing we all can do is hold the world index. It's the only strategy everyone can do. Anything else is betting against somebody else. If you own GM and not Ford, you're betting against someone who owns Ford. So we can't all be above average. Just, just can't be. You know, we ask, I, I ask my students uh, every year, how many of you think you'll be in the top half of the class? And 80% say they'll be in the top half of the class. Just, just cannot do it. There's an adding up constraint. So, so where do you draw the line and just say, you know what, being average is actually a skill. It's... it's <laughs> it, it is actually something that you, it, it's, it's an accomplishment not to be below average. So where do you, where do you draw the line and just say, I'm going to index to the world, hold some, you know, the world market portfolio of equities plus some bonds and call it a day. I can do that at Vanguard or Fidelity or anywhere else at 10 basis points, and I'm done. It's not very complicated. And most people should probably do that. Everybody, of course, says, no, we can't do that. We need this custom, this, that, the next thing, and we're going to try and play like Yale. Uh, knowing they can't, so they hire CIOs um, who think they can, but really can't. Um, so that's problem A. Problem B is, is, is those who can, if you have CIOs, and it's, it's, it's Alice's point, you know, being a long-term investor is a very difficult thing to do, and I believe the way you really make money is to have a long-term focus where you can be in, keep your powder dry and wait for others to blow up. And that's how you make money over the long term. And it's very hard when people are turning over every three years. How can they possibly be long term? When you put in place a strategy and then they come in, they don't know what the strategy is. You just can't be a long term investor, leaving aside the problem of being, of, of understanding the long term needs of the institution that you're supposed to be taking care of. Just trying to be a good investor, if you, if you change hands every three years, you can't be long term focused. You just, you just can't pull it off. So it's an enormous sort of problem. Like, uh I had a friend that used to tell me, and I apologize if I'm offending anybody in the room, uh, that the problem with bond, with bond managers was that they had to justify their fee. That if it was just, you know, if you just had a longer hold treasury kind of strategy, you wouldn't have that extra fee of 50 basis points. But more importantly, they felt like they had to do some trading in the pro program or they wouldn't be worthy of it. So CIOs cost a lot of money now. Um, and so if you have a new one that comes in, uh, you know, after three years, they're going to make changes. I mean, they just are. And so they're going to get off the old go plan, game plan. And as you know, buying and selling managers is a very, very expensive process. I mean, not just for the cost of buying and selling the stocks, but you're, it's the dislocation fees of being in and out of particular markets. Um, so it's, it's very, very expensive to do. Uh, Larry, we've talked a lot about nonprofits here, and but, uh, of course, Alice has been on the, on the pension side as well. You've been on the pension side. Uh, I was talking with Keith Ambridge here in Toronto a few days ago, and he said that the minimum size that he would recommend that, to consider hiring a CIO would be somewhere between eight and ten billion dollars. But we've heard here that maybe half a billion to a billion might be the right place in nonprofits. Is there a fundamental difference here? Are we missing something? Yeah, I mean, I think getting to the, the pension side, um, all the problems that both Alice and Andre mentioned, I think, are even more acute or, or bigger issues. Um, they, they, they have a number of other issues. On the corporate side, there has been a trend towards D.C. I'm really not going to comment on that, other than the observation that you know, pensions traditionally have been the biggest pools of capital, and to the extent that a lot of the large buyout funds have been funded by uh, a lot of money from pensions to the extent that you're reducing that one pool of capital that could could impact um, a source of capital for certain strategies but then on, on the on the public side where there's less of a move to DC um, again a lot of these issues that have been mentioned are just are bigger issues 
Um, and some of the issues in terms of what they are facing relative to endowments, I'd say for one is their bigger pools of capital. Uh, managing you know, 50 to $200 billion is a lot more difficult than managing the, the, the largest endowments, or, which are now 10 to $30 billion. Um, 10 to $30 billion, you can still do some interesting things um, that are going to be trying to produce those above average returns. Uh, when you're up to the $100 billion, $200 billion, there it gets back to what Andre mentioned. You know, maybe that's where you should really, uh, really consider indexing. Is it really going to be possible to be above average? Um, so, I mean, I, I think that's, that's going to be an issue. I just had lunch with Nancy Everett, who I worked with at VRS, um, yesterday, who's the General Motors, and they're over $100 billion, and they've done very nicely, but you know, she's talking about it's, it's very difficult. Uh, one of the things we've seen recently is a number of people leaving large uh, pensions, both on the corporate and public side. Uh, recently, Peter Gilbert left uh, the state of Pennsylvania. Very good track record there. Uh, did, did a number of innovative things there, and has gone to be the first CIO at Lehigh. Uh, very small, I mean, it's kind of situation similar to mine. Very small endowment, first CIO, um, and he was very much looking for the opportunity of actually investing small pool of capital and actually making a difference. Uh, Kim Walker recently left um, Quest to go to um, WashU, uh, another example of a very good pension CIO that's going to a much smaller pool of capital and is very, very much looking forward to being emboldened and having the opportunity to really making a difference. Um, so I think that level of difficulty with the size is, is one issue. Um, another issue is governance, which um, you know, people look at, you know, is there a secret sauce for endowments and foundations in terms of why they produce good returns? Um, one issue could be governance. I mean, a lot of these pools of capital, whether they're, they're endowments, foundations, pensions, in theory all should be long-term pools of capital. And in theory, long-term pools of capital do have abilities to, to undertake certain investments that give them the ability to capitalize on taking liquidity risks and other risks that shorter-term investors can't. But the problem is, and kind of a principal agent problem, is that as a manager of that pool of capital where you have a short, short, you know, short-term horizon as a career for a CIO, um, if, there's, there, if there's the risk that you, know, you have an underperformance for one year, two year, and then they blow you out, um, that's a real problem. Endowments foundations, I think, are, you know, from, a, from a safety standpoint, from a career risk standpoint, um, is a better place typically, not always, but typically to take benchmark risk, so to speak, take peer risk. Uh, pensions is a little more difficult. Uh, I think uh, on average, most public pensions, the boards roll over more frequently, the investment committees roll over more frequently. Um, you have a period of underperformance, you have a new investment committee member that comes in, could be a political appointee, um, it's going to have potentially some axe to grind uh, with the strategy that you just undertook, and that's why it's and it, it just underperformed. Um, they may pull the plug at the wrong time. So there could very well be, and I think typically what you've seen is pensions, in particular public pensions, being much more peer benchmark sensitive investors, so never straying away from a benchmark too much. Uh, for fear that if they underperform for a short period of time, they could have the plug pulled on, on that investment strategy. So that's something that I think causes a number of pensions to be a little more benchmark, uh, benchmark sensitive. And then there's just the, the decision-making process. You know, again, on endowments and foundations, a lot of the decision-making has been delegated much more to the CIO, to the staff. At pensions, with some exceptions, um, a number of the decisions are still made at the investment committee level. Um, managers come in, there's a bake-off, um, the, there's a vote by the investment committee uh, for the manager, and, and as we all know, kind of the group decision-making dynamic for selecting managers is really not always the best thing. And what typically happens, there'll be three managers that come in, they do a bake-off, and the committee says, well, we kind of like all three, let's just do a third each, each one of them. So you have, you know, you end up with this portfolio of, you know, hundreds of managers, which is, which is not uncommon um, with, with, with a lot of pensions. Um, so that kind of that governance in terms of how decisions are made, I think, is, is fairly crucial and I think tends to be handled better at endowments and foundations. 
Um, one of the issues I think that, I don't know if Alice had mentioned, but it has become a growing problem in the endowment world just as from a staffing standpoint, staffing compensation. Um, you've seen turnover at the CIO level. You've seen even probably even more turnover at the staff level underneath the CIO. And it's becoming increasingly difficult yeah. to keep, find people, keep people, retain people. Um, and I think that problem is becoming even harder at the pension side. Um, the, the amount of compensation that endowments pay is higher than, than, than pensions typically. And pension people, it's going to be, you know, in some respects, either if you have someone good, they're going to leave. Um, there could be an adverse selection problem. If they're not good, they may stay. And, you know, so to some extent, um, that could influence what kind of strategy. So if you're, say, on the board of a pension, and are worried that, you know, let's say you do have a limitation in terms of how much you can compensate, um, and you recognize, well, we may have a revolving door of people coming in and, and leaving, that may influence the type of strategies you want to under, undertake. Um, do you really want to have a complex Yale-style or Harvard management-style portfolio knowing that people are going to be there for two years and they're going to leave? Because um, that's where problems really can arise. If you, you put something in place that's complex, and then the people that put it in place are gone, um, that's when you could, could have a blow up. So knowing that, you're, you're probably in kind of an equilibrium, you'd expect that pensions probably should have a more passive index, less complex, complex strategy. Um, I mean, another issue in terms of pensions relative to endowments foundations, I mean, I think one of the things that Alice and other endowment folks have been very successful at is using the brand, using the relationship of the university or the foundation in terms of the mission of the foundation to get their way into quote unquote closed managers. Um, we're always looking to get into the managers that don't want us to get in. Um, you know, it's kind of like you know, when you're younger and you're dating, you always want to date the girl that didn't want to date you. <laughs> and it's the same way with us. I mean, some of the best managers are closed. And um, Endowments foundations, I think, typically have a better shot of getting access to those managers, either through an alumni relationship, um, it could be the relationship, again, the mission of the foundation, than the state of Virginia. You know, people are not going to have a warm, fuzzy feeling about the, the state of Virginia pension, um, as opposed to University of Virginia, where, again, you might have an alumnus that has some affiliation with the university that, that wants to get in there. Um, so, and again, I'd, I'd say um, just a final comment, which I think I mentioned, is that, I mean, one observation of, the, of, of pensions versus endowments, pensions just are, are more benchmark sensitive, um, take a lot, much, a lot less, in terms of the way they would even define risk, the risk they would typically define is a tracking error. How much air risk are they taking away from benchmark as opposed to in the endowment world, risk is usually defined more in terms of um, total risk. What is the risk of, you know, the downside risk? What is the risk that we're going to actually lose money for a period of time and not going to be able to support the mission of, the, of, of either the foundation or the university? Um, so they're much more benchmark sensitive, um, much higher percentage of, say, passive investing, uh, much smaller allocation alternatives, but at the end of the day, that might not be a bad strategy considering some of their other challenges because of, because of their size and because of some of the staff turnover, because you're under the microscope. I remember when I was at, at Virginia Retirement System and we implemented a hedge fund program uh, because we actually had a very good investment committee. Alice is on the investment committee. Um, we had some other people on the committee very supportive. <laughs> but you did that, and the first, there's an article written in the Richmond Times Dispatch the, the first line was, the VRS embarks on risky hedge fund scheme, uh, investing in managers similar to failed long-term capital. And that, that's, that's the article. Um, so you have to understand you're going to have articles written about you if you're a public fund when you do something. And this wasn't even, this you know, after hedge funds have been invested in for, you know, 10, 15 years, let alone if you start investing in them in the early 90s or the late 80s. So you have to recognize that you're going to be under that type of microscope, living in that type of fishbowl, which to some extent you are in the endowment world, especially if you're Harvard and you're Mohammed that's you know, following a legend. And as, as, as Andre is saying, they're, they're going to compare how many basis points he's below David Swenson for his first few years. Um, but otherwise, you're not living in quite the fishbowl 
in the endowment foundation world as you are in the public fund world. And I really think that influences, you know, in terms of how much risk, how much peer risk, how many new things can you really do? Because if you go out too far, chances are, again, you're going to have the plug pulled on you just at the wrong time. Uh, I would like to open this up to questions from the audience, if you have any at this time. Yes. Um, question for, I guess, all three of you. Um, in this market environment, what keeps you up at night? Oh, but everything. Yeah, every, everything. You know, the really interesting thing is um, we talk about that and think about it, but our time horizon is very low. It's not like yours. Um, and so if we can properly uh, keep that in perspective and not get caught up in what's going on in the market, we ought to sleep very well um, and not be worried about that. But, I mean, I think Andrea just put it out there. I mean, it's, you know, what keeps me up at night right now is, you know, what, unfortunately, it's a lot of, you know, what are your peers going to going to do? What are the June 30th numbers going to be right now and and why? You know, understanding what that is. And way too much compensation and way too many investment decisions now are being based on what your peers are doing as opposed to what's really happening in the market. So I wish I could say that the number one concern of an investment officer was something that was going on in the market, but it's much more about how everybody, how about everybody else is doing. My number one concern is I understand how it just can keep going up and up and up and up and up and want to be sure that we stay. I think my job is to stay out of the way of train wrecks. We aren't going to catch every up market, um, but hopefully we'll stay, we'll avoid the big blow-ups. So avoiding that next big blow-up while being creative enough and taking enough risk to have returns that are commensurate with what our expectations are. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll answer that a little differently because, I mean, I'm in a slightly different situation where I'm investing a very small pool of capital. We only have a billion dollar endowment. And we started really a kind of a greenfield operation three years ago where they didn't have a CIO. Um, so really we've embarked upon developing relationships, getting the portfolio invested, and I mean, there's nothing out there other than, you know, you, you, know, you could say until just, you know, at least the you know, last few weeks, credit's finally broken a little. You know, credit was very expensive. Just, you know, things in, that ha had any kind of yield had gotten very expensive. But otherwise, I mean, there's nothing really tactically that we're really trying to do right now um, other than trying to find really interesting small, because we're a small endowment. We, that's kind of our edge is that we can put a meaningful amount of money in something small, niche that but everyone else is saying the same thing. Uh, but really trying to look for those kind of more bottom-up relationships, managers that are all doing something different. So not from a statistical correlation sense in terms of looking at historical returns or re-diversify, but in, from the sense that every manager is kind of fishing in a different pond, gener has a different source of, of, of return generation or alpha, um, different parts of the world, different geographies, and just the process of looking around the world with very limited resources that we have as a small endowment as opposed to larger institutions like Alice and, and um, Andre's at, at Harvard, um, that's the challenge is you know, staffing. You know, how do I find that next good idea with a small group that we have? Um, those are the things as opposed to right now, I'm really not spending as much time thinking tactically because that's not really what we're trying to do. I, mean, I would say, um, let me, uh, you know, like Larry and Alice, our, our portfolio is very broadly diversified um, so that there's no single Bear Stearns-like event that's going to do any damage to us. And I would say, on the contrary, those create opportunities. And we've had hedge funds that have been short the subprime. Uh, we luckily didn't have anyone long the subprime, but if we did... Uh, it would be a small piece and, and it wouldn't do serious damage. Um, 
But other people's mishaps are, are someone else's opportunities, and you can set up your fund to invest so that people can take advantage of these blow-ups. So at some level, in, in a perverse way, we, we are hoping for blow-ups because they're fabulous opportunities. The one risk we can't diversify away that nobody can is this global economy. But that doesn't keep you up at night. The problem with that one is if it ends, it's probably going to end in one of two ways. Either a very slow, you know, um, it's just going to die a slow death. It's, it's going to take years and years and years where it just go, nothing happens. It goes down, 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 down a little bit all the time. And uh, that's just an awful environment to be investing in. There are no opportunities. You can't take advantage of people's blow-ups. Um, it doesn't keep me awake at night because it's going to be a 10-year problem if it happens. Uh, but it's going to be an awful environment to invest in. Um, the one that maybe keeps you up at night that is a, uh, of a systemic nature is that someone shoots somebody in the world that, that sort of ends the party. And that is, ends very suddenly. And we saw that in the early 1900s when um, the world in, in the early 1900s was about as integrated as it is today. It was extraordinary how, how well financially integrated the world was then. It was a wonderful period of economic development um, until someone shot somebody that started World War I, and then all ended. And uh, some version of that may occur today, and that could be sudden and, and awful. Um, it's hard to see how it happens, um, so I'm not losing a lot of sleep over it, but if you sort of pushed me as to how, you know, that was the one thing. I, I think the worst case is, and, and, and it's not unlikely, is that we have a long period of just lousy markets and the slow death. Yeah, I guess just taking up on that in terms of global economy, um, I think, you know, something that would be, you know, right now, we, there's, I think the globalization, the global trade flows, global capital flows that are unimpeded, as Andre said, it, probably since the early 1900s, it's, it's kind of the golden age right now. If you had any type of economic slowdown that would precipitate policy changes that would increase protectionism, not just in the United States, but globally, um, to try, that would kind of shut down that global growth, I think that would probably be one of the biggest negatives. And, you know, whether it's, you know, like World War I was where it's somebody shooting each other, it could be something as simple as just a global slowdown not, that, that then precipitates that type of policy response. That would be a huge negative because I think, the, I heard a Sandy Grossman at a conference earlier this year say a lot of people have in their portfolio exposure to global growth and they don't know it. I mean, it's across every asset class, whether it's private equity, whether it's hedge funds, whether it's public equity, whether it's the commodities. Commodities are driven by global growth right now. And so anything that slows global growth, and I think one of the biggest risks would be protectionist policies globally. Um, that would probably be, I mean, the one thing that would hold up were kind of relative value trades that's truly, you know, risk, that's truly zero beta to a lot of risk factors. That would probably hold up. But other than that, I mean, that's probably the biggest risk factor we all have across our portfolios. Other questions? In terms of asset classes, I guess venture capital is sort of the odd man out today. And I guess a contrarian would say that's where you should be putting your money. Uh, other people say that, uh, I guess a little bit like David Swenson, uh, invest in the top 10% or you can't do that. So should one be thinking about venture capital now or is it an asset class that unless you're in Google or one of the other huge winners, it, it, it really isn't the place for... Whoever would like it. I'll just say that um, every venture capitalist I talk to is so bearish on the industry. They are seriously bearish. You know, they say we used to buy things at five million pre-money and we put in two million. You know, now it's the same company we put in five million at 25 pre, and it's they just the valuations are high. Um, and then, and then, David's right, Swenson. You want to be in the top few firms that probably can make a lot of money still, and then, well, you can't get in. So, so unless you can find that. The other issue is how do you identify a good venture capitalist? How do you know who's good who isn't a marquee venture capitalist? So if Kleiner Perkins will take our money, we're glad to give it to him. But if Joe Schmo, VC, shows up and says, I'm great, you know, he says, you know, we are good at, we figured out how to turn this glass of water into energy cheaply. 
light up the world, you know, how do you know they're right? How do you know they're good investors? And, or are they just dreamers? And that's the problem. With, uh, with well, I, th I think, yeah, I think the other, the, <laughs> the other problem right now is if you talk to the VCs, there isn't a great new technology out there that they're all very excited about. Um, and that's what it was in the 90s. You know, we were making this big leap in the, in the uh, computer world that spurned all kinds of things out there. And now uh, they're sort of waiting for the next one to come. So, ex you know, with the exception of being able to get in people that you think will wait until that happens rather than just diddling around with whatever comes along in between and changing their stripes, um, that, that might be okay. But I have a much bigger issue, and that is I really don't think you should have allocations to asset classes. Um, I think that they're, uh, I think of the world as being primarily equities and bonds. And equities include venture capital and private equity. And I, real estate, depending on how you do it, falls into, you know, sort of one or the other categories. And I think we're still so caught up in the old uh, rhetoric that both the academics and the consultants gave us that said you have to have so much in such a box and you've got to fill it up. If it's not time to do venture capital, and instead you can find very micro cap buyout funds that are doing more growth or you can find certain people that are quote unquote venture capitalists but they'll migrate a little bit around and have a talent for doing that. Um, that's much more interesting um, to me as an opportunity. But I weigh every venture capital and every private equity uh, versus a long only manager versus a hedge fund. Where is the next great manager that's going to be able to add something to the portfolio above and beyond what we have now sitting? Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I agree with that last comment. And actually, organizationally, as an example, as an offshoot of that, um, I've tried to keep our staff very generalist. So, um, and you reduce some you know, special advantages of having specialization, but everyone talks to every type of manager, venture capital, buyout, uh, real estate, um, hedge fund. So that way, because when we're looking at everything, we want to have everyone thinking about, uh, you know, is, is manager A better than manager Z, even though they're comp doing something completely different? Just in kind of an absolute terms, do you think that manager is better than the other one? So we always want to be thinking in terms of those cross-asset class comparisons. Um, and then venture, we had the same issue. We had no venture portfolio to start with, no relationships. And then I have to say, you know, given limited resources, given limited staff time, yes, if I can get in Sequoia, yes, if I can get in Kleiner, I'd, I'd give an allocation to them, but do I want to spend a lot of staff time, quote unquote, schmoozing them? Or you know, and I just, it's not, it's, not a good, it's not a good return on, on staff time, in a sense. So we're, that's not, nothing we're going to be looking at. I have a question about uh, you know, keeping to the topic of the role of CIO. Um, Alice, you mentioned the importance of uh, communicating with the board members, and I you know Larry, you, you talked about uh, the uh, using the, the Georgetown name to access. Um, and so I have a question about thinking more holistically as a CIO about the assets of the institution more broadly, whether it's the brand name uh, of Georgetown or the board members. Um, just to share a, a, an anecdote on that topic, um, it was interesting to me that, that Amy Falls at uh, uh, Phillips Andover um, recently gathered uh, a group of about 50 alumni from Phillips Andover to a, a, a mini conference um, at the Yale Club in, in New York. And her view was that the institution with only $700 million in, in the endowment had this other tremendous asset, which was the the experience and knowledge of the uh, of the alumni, and how do you tap into that? Um, so my question is, you know, how do you think more holistically as a CIO, and how important is that? What tools might you use um, in that? Yeah, it's a uh, double-edged sword, though, mm -hmm. because you can raise expectations that individuals are going to have a huge say in what's going on. So it, it's it's um, I, I think it's an extraordinarily important asset. And we certainly do it, and our schools all want to do it because that's a development effort for them. I mean, if anything that they can do, again, to have a touch point with an alumni and make them feel useful. But you have to balance it very carefully that it doesn't become 
you know, a herding cats kind of thing for the CIO, and you're not doing more damage by hurting somebody's feelings. But, you know, in terms of of access to closed deals for people that are late to the table and trying to think about things, you know, a lot of that's uh, a lot of that's good. Um, I think it's very important, and I relish the role of being able to help the development people, you know, with some of the things that they're doing. I think that's one of the the fun parts of our job. If 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 this job were purely about investments, from my perspective, it wouldn't be the same job that it is when it when you're part of the institution. Um, but I do think it's a very, very fine line. I think that's that's wonderful. Um, and we've done it for young alumni. We've done it for more senior alumni. But you get, every time you have one of those, you get a raft of calls about, and, and it's always the marketing people from yeah. various different firms trying to sell you their particular product, which becomes a real conflict. So it's, it's, it's something that you just have to, to manage as gracefully as you can. Yeah, I've had the same challenge. I mean, I've done a number of those types of meetings. We have uh, Georgetown has something called the Wall Street Alliance, and uh, it's a great organization, philanthropic or- organization, funding scholarships. Um, and I've talked to subgroups of that organization and then other people in other cities. And, um, you know, one of the challenges is, as Alice said, after those meetings, I'll always get a call. You know, I've got, you know, a small cap growth fund and, then, you know, blah, 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 blah. And one of the challenges is, you know, we get thousands of calls like that anyway, and I, it's a challenge just managing that information flow as it is, and I still haven't figured out a good way of doing that and getting people calls back because I just can't do it. But then when they're an alumnus, you know, you, there's a higher bar. You really want to make sure they feel like they're being treated well. Um, so that's a challenge. But with that said, I mean, what we're always looking for is, you know, is there an XYZ manager that we really do want to have a relationship with? Is there a Georgetown connection? And then we can use that to get in. Or is there a, a Georgetown connection uh, or alumnus at a competing fund that will help us due diligence that manager? Um, so we're always looking because, you know, in our due diligence, which is, I think, what we're always trying to do and do better, trying to gather intelligence about a manager um, and trying to verify some of the facts that, 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 that they've told us, um, you know, the Georgetown network can be very valuable. It, it adds to our existing um, network. And then there's, you know, just kind of relationship you develop. There's, there's a guy that's a, a give, give an example, is a Georgetown alum that um, reached out to me because we were co-investors in, a, in the same fund, and he's just been a valuable asset going forward. He now he manages a, a family office of about the same size of our institution, and we're always swapping manager ideas, investment ideas, and so he's worked out to be a tremendous resource. But he's doing it with no, he doesn't have any vested interest in selling a product to me, as opposed to others that are always trying to figure out some way of selling a product. But, but it goes back to the I'm yeah, sorry, it goes back to the construction of your investment committee too, because it used to be when the investment committee actually ran uh, the endowments that you used to have to try to they used to try to get investment professionals on the committees, and uh, you have to be very careful about that too, because when you're starting to go into some new asset class, people that people are wedded or you know very biased towards whatever they do, and you know new ideas. Um, can either be intriguing to them because they think there's some business for them in it, or they can be very resistant to it. So it, it, um, as you get bigger and the board is more involved in governance as opposed to actually selecting and running the endowment, sometimes it's good to have outside people on the committee that are not involved in investments. Yeah. And I think you see, too, I'll just make a comment from our own research you, and discussions with people like Yale and Harvard and so forth. Uh, there is a lot more integration of the investment side now with other elements of the financial structure of universities particularly. Uh, but there's also, uh, particularly in, in the areas of development, you have Harvard uh, and now many other universities able to invest plant gifts in the endowment, which is an enormous marketing advantage for those institutions and with their alumni and parent bodies giving those kinds of gifts to endowment. That's a wonderful way of raising endowment on a long-term basis, bequests, planned gifts, pooled income funds, et cetera. Particularly if there's a promise of a very high return, which of course they've had. Huge mm-hmm. advantage, management of debt versus the, the, uh, uh, the debt side of the balance sheet versus the, inv- the investment, uh, the endowment, cash pools, et cetera. It's much more integrated now than it used to be. 
and I think probably, uh, of course, Harvard is the classic example of using the credit rating of the university to be able to leverage the endowment and create, in effect, as Jack Myers would call a giant hedge fund. But in fact, uh, you know, there are other elements that are that are increasing there, that are integrating. David Swenson, get back to Alice's point, and other and Larry's has a list of over 200 people that he is apprenticing for his investment committee. And in fact, their, their apprenticeship and their success in getting on that committee is long-term feeding the ideas that they have to the, to the university and access, of course, as well. Question, yes, yeah, behind, actually, just to hang on, Michael, for a second. Yeah, uh, I did a little Can't research see. earlier on. This has some questions for Alice. I did some earlier research and I saw that you were a majorette and also had a flash dance uh, uh, fantasy, so you know you're a good performer. Uh, questions this. Wow. In looking at your business model, uh, obviously, actually, I went to school up through from uh, yours in Middletown, Connecticut. I'm familiar with their investment policy. I know you have Bill Murray and Smith and a couple others. The modern CIO role in S Descat school, if you take a look at the worst store, uh, under uh, under gifting, overspending, and poor performance. What role does the new CIO or you or somebody like Morgan Creek, etc., have in looking at that with your clients, saying where are the various pieces that you have to think integrated wise as a small endowment, five hundred to a billion? Because those three factors affect what you do. Um, well, one of the advantages we have is that we get to pick the clients yeah. too and so those are all things I look for people that have already thought about those issues and have the tools um, so a, a good CFO um, and a good board that are very aware of all those issues um, but 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 I view one of our roles as not just running their endowment but helping them think through those issues and so we go as far as meeting with student groups, which I think is important. That's, that's part of it. I mean, none of us particularly like that role, but nevertheless, it's, it's part of what keeps us young, working with, working with um, students as part of the school. I view thinking with the CFO about the debt that they have outstanding as being a very important part and whether it's appropriate risk and whether we size the risk differently in the portfolio because of the debt they have outstanding. And we look and work with them on their spending policies and everybody in all cases in ours was either at high and coming down or was, was, was already down. Um, so that's important that they aren't spending themselves out of business. Um, and, and I think that all of those issues are, and, and then fundraising in all cases, they've gotten it. The problem is that the people they're trying to catch up with are, have also gotten it, and they're also raising, raising a lot of money. But, but it's, um, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's a huge disparity between schools that went to sleep in the 1990s and didn't raise any money and did have high spending policies and thought that they could spend their way into, uh, a number of them thought they could spend their way into um, you know, a higher status and ranking by putting a lot of physical facilities on only to have put the debt on and then show their endowment going down um, in 2000. So there's there's a tremendous number of schools that are out there in that you spot. You get prodded out with the transformational gift pitch. <laughs> <laughs> um, we don't make that kind of money to help that. <laughs> no, there's a lot of... Oh, no, no, it's, no, yeah, no, it's very... That, I, mean, I think that's a very interesting thing. I was always astounded at the University of Virginia that that was one thing they never used us for. Uh, I, I just found it absolutely because I even volunteered to go, so I obviously wasn't presentable. Um, but, um, but I have I have made um, in in the schools that we have now I have met with alumni groups, um, but not for the transformational gift the president usually handles that. Michael, I just kind of follow up on the alumni point and sort of take the opposite side uh, with the Harvard example where you had a um, an alum who was disturbed about the compensation issues of um, the investment committee. Now, if you could comment on whether you think, um, in fact, the investment team was overpaid for what they were doing, and should the administration of Harvard have caved, if you will, to an alum who was um, complaining that his million dollar gift was going to pay these outrageous uh, compensation 
and that being no, I'd be happy to uh, say a couple of things about that, having just watched it very closely. The, um, it's pretty tough to say they're overpaid when they got paid for performance, firstly. And second, they got paid a lot less than they would have been paid had they been external hedge fund managers. It's well, very or, or maybe Harvard, or maybe to making now too. Thing. By the way, it was a lot. It was a lot. So these folks are all now outside, making a ton more money to the detriment of Harvard uh, University. So, um, yeah, and it gets to the alumni point. You know, these guys said, "Well, there are a lot of people I'm sure would do it for less." And yeah, you know, I'm willing to play shortstop for the Boston Red Sox uh, for nothing. Um, for free. For free. Um, you pay them. Yeah, I'd pay them. That would be fun to see. You know. <laughs> um, and, 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 and part of the part of the role of you know having the this is a, all about governance is insulating the investment group to just do good investing is very hard to do. And when they formed Harvard Management Company, one of the issues was uh, it's part of the university, so they have to disclose salaries. And way back when they first created the issues, could they have created a different organization? that wouldn't have to disclose. And I think long term they would be much better off if they could have. Unfortunately, you can't. It is disclosed. And, uh, and that's, uh, but it's unambiguous that they had a much better deal with these smart people in-house paying less than they would outside. Any other bank questions? Yeah, bank questions. Yeah, follow-up question to that then? Yes. Yeah. Given that it is an infinite horizon, first of all, Larry, I, I can't believe that a woman would turn out and pay with you. Endowment fund, and that did talk about returning risk. What is the right compensation plan to hopefully keep a CIO there for 5, 10, 15 years? I mean, that's the beauty of Yale and Harvard, which I also believe the five or six schools that run over $10 million, those should not be the benchmark that we should be using for our CIOs. But what is the right benchmark? What is the right comp skill? How should we tie in that long term? Well, I, just my response would be: I thought, um, I mean, I didn't know the exact terms. I mean, reading the Harvard management case that was written up in terms of the way they structured the compensation, it seemed like a very clever um, structure in terms of paying out some, holding back some. So, in a sense, there was a clawback. I wish a lot of hedge funds had a similar. I mean, Convexity has actually that structure now that Jack brought with them to the new fund. Um, I wish a lot of hedge funds had that structure. Uh, I thought it was a very well thought out um, compensation structure. Something like that seems clever to me. Um, I do think that there needs to be some sense of, I mean, so many of the, the, the decisions that we're making that are truly going to determine whether we're you know, top decile or bottom decile are going to be some of the illiquid private equity or private equity style real asset investments that are being made um, that really don't you know, take 5, 7, 10, 12, 15 years to pay off. And the sense that you have this turnover that's a lot shorter than that when decisions are being made that aren't going to pay off for t well beyond the term that someone's going to actually be leaving, there's got to be some way to have the person realize the benefit, you know, kind of like a private equity manager, where they get a carry that's not paid out until the end, um, that really will induce someone to stick around to realize that payoff. Uh, because that's what's really going to distinguish. I mean, you know, the number that, that Yale's putting up, a lot of those numbers, my guess, would be due to you know, real assets and private equity commitments that were made you know, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, a long time ago, maybe five years ago. So that's, there's got to be a sense that the person who's making that decision is going to be there to realize the repercussions and so can re reap the rewards. And so I, that's, that would be you know, the comment. I think the average I heard last week of the Yale manager's uh, tenure is 17 years. Just to give you an idea. The manager. Mm -hmm. yeah. The manager yeah. list. Right. The average okay. tenure. The manager list now 17 years. But, you know, I think you've got to, you know, people do what you pay them to do, not what you want them to do, is a well-known saying. And you've got to ask, what do you want a CIO to do? And, you know, risk management is a crucial function, whether it's understanding that we have debt that the institution has taken on and we need to take less risk elsewhere, understanding what other risks there are, understanding how risky is the donor pool and 
and you know what 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 is the gift stream like over time? So if you want people to think about risk, you've got to pay them to manage risk, um, and that's very hard to do. It's the hardest thing in investing is to figure out how much risk someone's really taking because you don't know until it's over how much risk they take. And so these very long term, you know, paying someone for a, for the very long term is sort of one way to get at that. But some of it could be very subjective, you know. You can, you can tell if someone's thoughtful about risk or not. You can pay them for that. Um, so there may be more pieces to the, to the compensation than, than just a, a carry on the return in some sense. But, but you've got to figure out what you want them to do and then try and pay them for those individual pieces. Of it. But there is a, um, a perception at most smaller institutions and on the pension level, at a very large level, a large thing, that the salaries cannot exceed some level. The presidents, you know, whomever it is. Um, the bigger universities got over that pretty quickly when they started having doctors and business school people around. Um, they could have consulting on the side, et cetera. But, but I was listening to somebody, I can't even remember what it was, but it was a it was a large pension fund, and, and it was like $30 million, and it was a Jesuit pension fund of some sort, and nobody could get paid more than the president. And so the salary of that person was $150,000, um, and they were running $30 billion. So, you, I mean, I'm, I'm with Andre. You get what you, what you pay for. But there, but there, I mean, that's why I got a business, because... You know, they, you know, just like Harvard, the salaries inside were a lot cheaper than what they were going to have to pay managers to do it on the outside. But nevertheless, when it's a direct salary and it shows up as a budget line item, it's a very different thing than if it's buried in a return as a net number. And it's sad, um, but, it is, but it is a reality. On the other hand, I mean, I do think that, that we've all gotten ahead of ourselves in everything. <laughs> out there and the investment industry just in general is extraordinarily well paid and at some point, you know, there people will say why, you know, when it gets bad. Okay. This has been a terrific panel. I want to thank you for coming down this morning. Many of you have traveled a long way and uh, thanks to the audience for good questions. I'll turn it back over to Steve. Thanks, John. Um, Susan reminds me that you need to fill out your scorecards. She's small but she's tough and she won't let you out of the room. <laughs> But uh, please fill out your report cards, let our speakers know how you've done. Uh, also, there's going to be a board meeting in this room right after uh, this session. Uh, the next session of the roundtable will be on August 16th, where we're going to have an LBO firm debate a deep value firm, or the other way around, in terms of who can extract more value uh, from the market. Uh, we're forming our new best practices uh, subcommittee. This is going to be on portfolio construction after the three... Uh, series on due diligence. Uh, that uh, committee or that working group will be chaired or co-chaired by Bob Hunkler and Ed Barksdale. And if you have any insights, if you'd like to work on that committee, let me know or let Susan know. Uh, I'd like to compliment John Griswold and the Common Fund Institute for um, inspiring uh, this session. Uh, Dave Storrs also for uh, starting the Endowment Institute. And uh, most importantly, um, uh, the fellow sitting to my right, uh, they've been a really quiet and solid supporter of the roundtable. First, when they came on board, they delivered Ernesto Zadillo from Yale and former president of Mexico. He's managed to persuade Sandy Weil to come here to the round table, and he promises to bring Bob Rubin one day. Dave, would you like to say anything to the members? Uh, today's session, I think, really underscores the value that the round table brings to investors, world-class thinkers and practitioners at the top of their game who are interesting and entertaining and eager to share their thoughts and to provoke thoughtful discussion. Uh, so I think the Greenwich and Chappaqua offices of City are really, really proud to sponsor the roundtable. Thank you, Dave. Well, that's good. Thank you all for coming okay. very far. Good job.